What is up guys, Matt back with another video. Today we're going to look at King David's downfall, the consequences of his sins in 2 Samuel chapter 11. So grab your Bible and let's get started. I remember when my wife and I were in high school and I had a pretty blemish free record until one day that she and her friend suggested that we skip class. The problem is I got caught by my parents. Because of that one bad decision, our night at the dance that Saturday was not great. We got all dressed up and we went and mom and dad said we could have one dance and then we had to come home. How bad is that? You know, I'd almost rather just not go. But the point of all this is that sin or disobedience has a consequence. And it doesn't just affect you, it affects others around you. My wife didn't get to enjoy the dance either that night, although her fault. And after I had to build trust back with my parents. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see David going from this man after God's own heart to committing three of the big Ten Commandments, just bam, bam, bam. You know, we have coveting, adultery, and murder. Some of you may have the question, David was repentant and he was sorry, and he asked God for forgiveness in Psalm 51. So why hasn't everything uh, been okay after that? Or why didn't things go back to the way they were before? Well, I wanted to talk to you guys about that today because I want you guys to know and be able to tell others that may be sinning that sin isn't a small thing and why it affects the rest of your life. First, there's no verse that I was, I'm aware of or that I could find. And I looked really hard that talks about how if you do something and repent for that, there will be no consequences. But I could list probably 15 verses or so that warn you not to sin and what will happen if you do. The one verse that hit the hardest to me was Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows from the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So about a year ago, I purchased Dr. David Jeremiah's study Bible. I've really enjoyed it. And he's got some good commentary in here. And on chapter 6, verse 8 of Galatians, he put a note in here, according to John Scott, the author, in the message of Galatians, sowing to the flesh means to pander to it, cuddle and stroke it instead of crucifying it. Every time we allow our mind to harbor a grudge, nurse a grievance, entertain an impure fantasy, or wallow in self-pity, we are sowing to the flesh. Every time we linger in bad company, whose influence we know we cannot resist, every time we lie in bed, when we ought to be up and praying. Every time we read pornographic literature, every time we take a risk which strains our self-control, we are sowing to the flesh. Some Christians sow to the flesh every day and wonder why they do not reap holiness. Holiness is a harvest. Whether we reap it or not depends almost entirely on what and where we sow. Do you guys remember what happened before Uriah was killed? Do you remember what King David tried to do? He tried to get Uriah to go back home and sleep with Bathsheba to make it look like he got her pregnant and that the baby was his instead of King David's. Basically, he tried to cover up his lie or his sin with another lie. You can see that in 2 Samuel chapter 11, 6 through 11. And because Uriah didn't go back home, David had to go to plan B. He got him drunk so that maybe he would go home and be with his wife in verses 12 through 13. But Uriah's unwavering dedication ultimately got him killed. Technically, King David got him killed, but kind of splitting hairs there. But we will see in the next few verses, 14 through 17, Uriah gets put on the front lines and gets killed by King David's orders. Because King David chose sin and even more sin before confessing, he faced some pretty bad consequences. And I want to run through those consequences with you guys. Uh, please read on your own, though, verses 12 through 19, and you'll see all that I'm about to list. First, we have King David's illegitimate son with Bathsheba dies. Then we see Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar. And then Absalom murders Amnon for raping Tamar. And then Absalom tries to kill King David. He also attempts to overthrow King David and take the throne. And you can see that plot to take over his father's throne around 2 Samuel chapter 15. So about four years, Absalom plotted to overthrow his father. And one day he declares he's king and David runs off to the mountains for fear of being killed. And David kind of has this come to God or come to Jesus moment, if you will, uh, with himself in Psalm 3. Then King David, through a lot of crazy days of our lives, not a sponsor, nor do I condone conditions, finds himself with the loss of another son. Absalom is killed in the battle between the two of them, along with about 20,000 men. You know, that's a lot of men dying because really King David's sinful lifestyle. So for anyone keeping score, David has lost the throne temporarily. Three sons are dead. One daughter's virginity is gone. 
and David had to fire his nephew Joab from being the general of his army because Joab ultimately killed Absalom. And then we have 20,000 people die for this cause. We want to talk about awkward family reunion later on. I bet they had it. So three things I want you guys to take away from this message because I think it's important to think of them in your own lives, but also when you're witnessing to someone. Number one, no one is immune to sin in their lives. It's all around us and we all give into it, no matter how little or how big. As we work on our sanctification, though, we should be sinning less and have more control over our thoughts and our actions. Number two, the consequences of your sin can hang around for sometimes years or, as we saw in Abraham's case, thousands of years through the descendants of his son that he had with Hagar. You know, your sin can affect you or your children down the line, like in David's case. You know, it really seems like when you read through uh, 2 Samuel, as soon as he lusted after Bathsheba, that's really when everything kind of fell apart. And number three, no matter what you or anyone has done, God's grace is greater than all of that. I want you guys to remember this week, if you have the opportunity to witness to someone, no matter how small, Share David's story and how God forgave him. Then talk about how God forgave you and changed your life. We are to plant that seed and let the Holy Spirit work. Hey, if you guys have any questions or comments, leave them below. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell for any new content I make. I love you guys. Have a great week. Lift those weights and grow that faith.